Lord tonight for his goodness and his mercies towards us, the children of men. We're grateful, grateful for his mercies towards us. Let me honor the presence of the Lord to our associate pastors, Oliphant and Brown and their respective families, to my own family, to all of our brothers and sisters, visiting ones. God bless you. God bless you. Welcome. This is Bethel United Church of Jesus Christ Apostolic. This is the Portmore branch. Good to have you joining with us, those who are joining with us for the first time. God bless you. I see some members from other, other assemblies. Good to have you, Sister Stolz. God bless you. God bless you. And so many others along, um, so many others who are, who are joining with us tonight. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Praise the name of the Lord. We're going to be examining a particular study tonight. God bless you, Sister Snape. Good to have you. God bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus and Sister Henry Philistina. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Praise the name of the Lord. We're going to be going into a study tonight. And let me just kind of give you the backdrop before we get right into the study. Um, we have been looking at prayer for a little while now. And it's, it's just kind of pressing on me to continue because we need to get to that place where we really continue in prayer until we get the answer from the Lord. So you might be saying, Pastor, we've done this before. Yes, we've done this before, but we have got to get there until we are doing it and we are getting the response. This is from the Lord and are experiencing the character change. So it's not just getting what we want, it's getting what God wants and experiencing the Christ-like transformation in our own lives prayer is the tool that transforms us to be more and more like jesus christ himself and so if we stay in prayer and couple the prayer with the word our very attitude our actions our thoughts the words that, ex that we express will be you know, if we want to ever find out where we are, just listen to the words we express and look at the actions we display. And we can find out, well, that's debatable as well, because the truth be told, sometimes we have been, we have actually deceived our own selves. But we just, if we stay long in prayer, then God will reveal to us our very heart's condition so that we can know what to do. And so we're going to be continuing. And so we're going to look at an Old Testament example of a pattern that God gave for a structure that represents our own salvation. And this area of study not only presents to us the structure that, that depicts our salvation, but also how do we approach God? All right, so tonight is going to, going to be an overview night. And we're going to, next week coming up, God's willing, God's prayer lives, We'll be having a week of prayer meeting, so we're going to be examining this particular structure in the light of prayer. So there are several different perspectives that is brought to this particular structure, and the structure we're going, to, the, the the perspective we're going to look at this time around is that of prayer. All right, but so here is the backdrop tonight. Here is the overview, and then next week we'll pick up and do it in different sections that leads us and shows us how to approach God in prayer so that we can be successful in prayer. Praise the name of the Lord. And so we're going to go to the study tonight. Pray that you can see my screen clearly. And so we read from Exodus 25, one through nine, and it spoke to us concerning um, God instructing Moses to build a sanctuary and that he, God, could dwell amongst his people, all right? So they came through the Red Sea and they got into the wilderness. And God now desires to reveal himself to his people. God desires to come by his people and live amongst his people. So it says, build me a house so I can dwell with you. 
quite interesting that the spirit of God that is so is evident everywhere desires to tabernacle amongst men in a physical structure. Um, if you think about it, when Solomon built the temple, he said, God, the heavens of heavens cannot contain you. How much more this little temple? You know, um, but it is true that God is able to bring himself to a place like that. He did it when he manifested himself in flesh. So the fullness of the God that dwelleth in Jesus Christ bodily. And so what we see is that God has always desired to have fellowship and communion with mankind. And when we examine this particular structure, one of the things that we look at is the fact that, yes, he is desirous of tabernacling with us. And when we look at Genesis 1, for example, it outlines for us the, the dwelling place of man, which is the earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And out of man's habitation being earth, we have derived so many studies concerning man's dwelling place. And we have various different studies and various different um, um, employ um, um, positions coming out. We have persons who are archaeologists, we have persons who are zoologists, we have persons who are astronauts. We are fascinated by the sky above us, the earth beneath us, the sea, the animals, the plants. We're fascinated. And so basically one chapter is given to, to really planet earth. It's the summarization in chapter number one of Genesis. But concerning the habitation of God, between Genesis and Revelation, we have over 50 chapters, over 50 chapters that is dedicated to the habitation of Almighty God. Now, if there's anybody on this planet that should have interest in the habitation of God, it must be the child of God. Why? Because we have become the very habitation of God. We have become the dwelling place of Almighty God. And if mankind is able to derive so many other studies concerning his own natural domain, then can you imagine we are not able to, uh, to exhaust the depth and the height and the breadth of the habitation of God itself. And so it certainly will lead us from a, from a place of time into eternity, you know, to, to, if we decide to explore. And we must, we must, because how then do we really appreciate the things of God if we don't explore the dwelling place of God, because it is in him I move and dwell and have my being, and I need to know how to walk within him since I am in his presence, in his power, since I have become the habitation of Almighty God. All right, so our objectives tonight is to look at the purpose, the pattern, and the prefigured church. All right, so we're saying that the tabernacle structure in the wilderness wanderings during the mosaic period had a pattern, it had a purpose, and it was actually a prefigure of the church today. All right, so, so if we understand that this is a prefigure, then it makes sense for us to embrace the study of it so we can appreciate where we're coming from and where it is that we are going. All right, praise the name of the Lord. So the tabernacle served as a place for God to dwell amongst his people and a place where his people could commune with him. All right, so a place where he could dwell amongst his people and a place where his people could commune with him. It's the, the structure stood as a visual reminder to Israel that they serve the true and living God. So this visible manifestation that represented the presence of God stood there as a reminder to them that they serve the one true and living God. Very, very important. The structure and service showed a sinful people how they could come before a holy God in worship and the service to offer sacrifices for sin and to receive instructions and counsel from God's word. Thus, it was a graphic portrayal of God's redemptive plan for his people. In other words, when you talk about a redemptive plan, we're talking about 
God's plan to redeem mankind. And this tabernacle structure is the plan that he used and that he fulfilled in order to bring us so great salvation. And so if we study the tabernacle, we're going to see what Jesus did on the cross, how he walked through the tabernacle while he was here in the flesh, how he fulfilled the role that the high priest played in the Old Testament tabernacle, how he fulfilled that when he came in the earth as flesh, bled and died as the lamb placed on the altar on the cross of Calvary, thus bringing redemption to mankind. So this Old Testament picture is a, is a, is a, is a parable, as it were, a photograph that helps us to understand what is it that Jesus Christ has really done for us to bring us so great salvation. If we understand this, then it will begin to help us to live before God in the way he wants us to live. Because the very lives of the priests in the tabernacle represents the very lives that we should be living today. And they had to live separ separated lives unto the Lord so they could be continuously used by the Lord to keep the presence of God in the nation. And if you're applied to today, to keep the presence of the Lord in our lives. The priest had that role and responsibility to ensure that God stayed and not go. And we have seen in the Old Testament where God went. For example, in the time of Eli, the Lord went, wasn't there with them anymore. Um, the priest Eli died along with two of his sons and um, his, his, his daughter, his daughter-in-law. Um, gave birth to a child and she called him Ichabod and said that the glory of God has departed. God left. And so the, the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant that represented the presence of God. And so God will go and God will go. But, but, but the priest has responsibilities, their responsibility to actually entertain the presence of the Lord continually on a daily basis. And so there are roles and responsibilities that they must employ to be able to do that. And similarly today, we who are now a part of the priesthood, royal priesthood, holy nation, peculiar people, have this awesome responsibility to keep God into our lives and to represent him here on earth before men. All right, so every aspect of the tabernacle, every aspect, every minute detail from the brazen altar where sacrifices were offered for sin, to the mediating priest who offered the sacrificial blood on the mercy seat, pointed to God's redemptive plan. Every aspect of it pointed to the redemptive plan. So it's meaningful to our own lives because we have been redeemed. The people could only approach God through a blood atonement and a mediating priest. That was the only way they had to take a sacrifice and the priest would offer and the priest would stand in the gap between themselves and God to atone for their sins. That's the role that was played by the priest then. This was typified in the ministry of Christ who left his throne in heaven and tabernacled amongst his people. In Christ, we have the high priest, the perfect blood sacrifice and access to God for all who put their trust in him. So Jesus Christ fulfilled all of what the Old Testament showcased, or showcased to us. So he became the priest. He became the sacrifice and became the very access that we need to the throne room of Almighty God. So the Lord provided the pattern, as we saw in Exodus 25, we read earlier, and the people provided from a willing heart the material. Where did they get this material from? Since they were slaves, they were poor. If you remember the story quite well, when they were coming out of Egyptian bondage, they spoiled the Egyptians. And the Egyptians gave them gold and silver and brass and expensive material, purple and scarlet and all these different things they, they received. Because the Lord plundered them. The Lord gave them favor. And they gave them this thing and said, go away from us. 
But there was a reason why God allowed that. So, so whenever, whenever you have a war, you always have spoils at the end of the war. And the winner takes the spoils. So God, through Moses, conquered Pharaoh and Egypt and took the spoils. In fact, they gave the spoils. I'm going to be careful to say they gave the spoils. God, God allowed them to give the spoils. And, and Israel now became the nation to carry the cargo across the Red Sea into the wilderness for a reason. Because God, according to the text we read earlier, now required of them to bring an offering. So you see, God is going to ask you to give out of what he gave. That is not unfair. God is the one that gave you the gold, gave you the silver, everything that you need. And now he says, give me a portion of it. And when you give it to me, give it to me from a willing heart. If they're not willing, you keep it. But when if you're willing, bring it. And so the offerings were of gold and silver and brass and jewels and fine linen and dye from Egypt, goats hair, ram skin, seal skin from the Red Sea and shittim wood from the Sinai desert. All right, let's look at some of these offerings. Um, have an appreciation for them. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel that everyone who wants to may bring me an offering. Here is a list of items you may accept on my behalf. Gold, silver, and bronze. Blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. Fine linen. Goat hair for cloth. Tanned ram skins and fine goat skin leather. Acacia wood. Olive oil for the lamps. Spices for the anointing oil and the fragrant incense. Onyx stones and other stones to be set in the ephod and the chest piece. I want the people of Israel to build me a sacred residence where I can live among them. You must make this tabernacle and its furnishings exactly according to the plans I will show you. Exactly according to the plans that I have showed you. Don't make it how you want, Moses. Make it according. I have a blueprint. Build a house from the blueprint. We're talking about God's house. We're talking about God's dwelling place, which we have become. And I'm going to jump the gun a little because we're talking about our own lives. So God has a blueprint for my life. I can't build my life according to the pattern that I want. It has to be built according to the pattern that he has given to us through his word. He gave Moses a blueprint and said, build the house this way. That blueprint is still available to us from a spiritual perspective. Um, when you get to the New Testament, it tells us that uh, we have the foundation, that of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone and we built upon that foundation. So there's already a pattern set as to how to build our lives according to the pattern that God has showed to us. So today, God desires that his people give themselves to his service and then bring their gifts willingly for his work. We give ourselves first to his service, the things that pertain to the Lord, the things that God desires to do. We give ourselves to the work of the Lord. And the gifts we bring with a willing heart for the work of the Lord. So we use the gifts to do the work. And we give our time, our talent to the Lord so that we can do the work of the Lord. Now the tabernacle was a focal point for Israel's community and life. With the tribes dwelling around its four tribes, or four sides. Right? On the east side, under the standard of the line of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulon. On the west side, we have, under the standard of the ox, we have Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. On the northern side, under the standard of the eagle, we have Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. And on the south side, we have the standard of the man. Under the standard of the man, we have Reuben, Simeon, and God. This does not include Moses, Aaron, and the priests, and the Levites, the Kohathites, Gershonites, and the Mirahites 
who numbered approximately 23,300 were placed around the tabernacle. So the structure is in the middle, the priests are immediately around it, and then the rest of the camp is on the outskirt of the Levites. All right? And if you look at the numbers, 186,000, 108,000, 151, and when you look at the pattern, if you were elevated above, if you are looking from the sky, down at the tabernacle with the people gathered around it, you would see the picture of a cross. So the very numbering and, the God, and how God placed them around the tabernacle, you could see the formation of a cross within the wilderness itself. God gave a plan, gave specific instructions, how it should be built, how the person should surround it. And if you look at the, various, the standards under which each fell, um, the standard of the lion, the standard of the ox, the standard of the eagle, the standard of the man, speaks to the very four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because Matthew presents Jesus as the king, which is under the stand of the lion, the king of the jungle. Matthew, Mark, Mark presents Jesus Christ as a servant, which is under that of an ox, because the ox is a domestic animal that's used as a servant, as a part of a family, a burden bearer. Under the standard of the eagle, we have the gospel of John. All right, and under, and under, under the standard of the man, we have the gospel of Luke, who presents Jesus Christ as the perfect man. Under, under, the, under the standard of the eagle, as I said, John before, uh, presents Jesus Christ as the son of the living God. And when you speak about standard, think about a flag. All right, so they would, they would be there, each tribe, and they have the flag that represents them, and it's lifted high, and they know and understand under which they operate, all right? And it's, it's, it's interesting also because this is the very nature of these boys as they were described by their very fathers in the book of Genesis. All actually, all of it ties up beautifully together. Just like our own, our own environment in which we are, um, the prime minister have, our own, have its own standards, um, the, the, gen the governor general also, and so there's a standard that is there to govern and to guide. And here we have similarly, and, and all of this is coming out of, of the Bible knowledge, which is some of the things that we see in our world today and the laws that we have, they're coming out of the Bible. Now, the pattern of the tabernacle, the, the, the outer court um, was 150 feet long and 75 feet wide, right? So length by width, enclosed by fine twine linen, seven and a half feet high. So that's the height of the fence. Its gate, which was on the east side of the court, was 30 feet wide. So that's the gate you're looking here at the front. Uh, a very wide gate, because when you look at the complete length, which is 75 feet across, then 30 of that is the gate. And the only entrance into the tabernacle. All right? I am the way. I am the truth. And I am life. This gate is the way. The way into the court is the way into the Lord. Because Jesus is the way. Um, when, when David says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, David understood this because this is a pattern that was set. So when you came through this gate, you're coming to worship. So we enter with thanksgiving. So, so there's a heart filled with gratitude that I'm able to come to the courts of the Lord, to the house of the Lord, excited, filled with jubilation. Yes, what an awesome opportunity. Because I am taking my sacrifice with me. God is going to accept my sacrifice and I'm going to be in good standing with him. I'm not going to come under his judgment. I'm going to come under his mercy and his grace. They came to church excited. My God. The linen curtain was held in place by 60 pillars made of acacia wood covered with bronze, seven and a half feet apart. Each pillar was secured by a bronze socket with cords fastened at the top and tied to the ground with a bronze stake. Not sure if you can see clearly, but I'm going to show, show you a video with it shortly. So you can see, but it's actually on your screen, the photograph towards your left. So that's the acacia wood and the top of it are the silver capitals. So it's capped off at the top, the white linen kern, and there are rods that actually hold the pillars in place so they do not fall. Because in the desert, it can get windy. The wind can get very high and very strong. And so they are secured. And if you think of we being pillars, which is often as the Lord have described us as such, those cords of love actually holds us in place so that the winds of life begins to blow. We are held 
secure my God and Savior, Jesus. The pillars are more secure by the silver bars. Those silver speaks to my redemption. Because silver speaks to re being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So I've been redeemed. So the, 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 the pillars themselves, having the silver on top, represent the fact that they have been redeemed. All right? And they are held by cords. That speaks to our own lives likewise. Um, so a silver bar that connected them near to the top, from which the linen curtains were hung, each pillar were crowned with a silver capita. Let's look at the outer court. Then make a courtyard for the tabernacle, enclosed with curtains made from fine linen. On the south side, the curtains will stretch for 150 feet. They will be held up by 20 bronze posts that fit into 20 bronze bases. The curtains will be held up with silver hooks attached to the silver rods that are attached to the posts. It will be the same on the north side of the courtyard. 150 feet of curtains held up by 20 posts fitted into bronze bases with silver hooks and rods. The curtains on the west end of the courtyard will be 75 feet long, supported by 10 posts set into 10 bases. The east end will also be 75 feet long. The courtyard entrance will be on the east end, flanked by two curtains. The curtain on the right side will be 22 and a half feet long, supported by three posts set into three bases. The curtain on the left side will also be 22 and a half feet long, supported by three posts set into three bases. For the entrance to the courtyard, make a curtain that is 30 feet long. Fashion it from fine linen and decorate it with beautiful embroidery in blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. It will be attached to four posts that fit into four bases. All the posts around the courtyard must be connected by silver rods using silver hooks. The posts are to be set in solid bronze bases. So the entire courtyard will be 150 feet long and 75 feet wide with curtain walls seven and a half feet high made from fine linen. The bases supporting its walls will be made of bronze all the articles used in the work of the tabernacle, including all the tent pegs used to support the tabernacle and the courtyard curtains, must be made of bronze. Tell the people of Israel to bring you pure olive oil for the lampstand, so it can be kept burning continually. The lampstand will be placed outside the inner curtain of the most holy place in the tabernacle. Aaron and his sons will keep the lamps burning in the Lord's presence day and night. This is a permanent law for the people of Israel, and it must be kept by all future generations. My God, Holy Ghost, Adnako Shama, Hallelujah, Jesus. My God, I feel the presence of the Lord. Build me a house. I want to live with you. And you got to build it according to the pattern that I have showed you in the mount. Don't put your opinions on it. Don't put your own designs on it. Put it the way I gave you the instructions, Moses. You're building it for me because it's my house. Make sure that the lamp doesn't go out. You have got to make sure that the light of your life, the light of the Holy Spirit, never goes out. Holy Ghost. The responsibility is ours. Each individual has the responsibility to ensure that the fire of the Holy Ghost does not go out. He warned them time and time again. Because there's no JPS inside of this tabernacle. The only light that is there is the light that came from the fire that was on the brazen altar. A sacrifice that was acceptable by God my God and Savior, Jesus, a sacrifice for sin. God sent a fire and, and lit that sacrifice. And then you take that fire and bring it on the inside of the holy place and light the lamps. And when you light those lamps, keep them burning bright. Trim your feeble lamp, my brother. Keep them burning. Because in the day that it goes out, you are left in darkness. And it is dangerous. Very, very dangerous. The furniture and its placement from the brazen altar to the mercy seat typifies 
the various ministries of Christ on our behalf. Every furniture and where they were placed, ministry had to be done at each stop. And they were typical of what Jesus would come to the earth to do. The tabernacle, a prefigure of the heavenly, because there's a pattern in heaven. With its ordinances was only a, a, a figure for the time then present, but looks towards Christ's sacrificial death, which was to mediate a new covenant by means of his shed blood for the redemption of mankind. Hallelujah, mighty God. Hallelujah. Let's look at the placement. And part of our objective tonight is that we're looking at this because we're going to be praying the tabernacle in another couple of weeks, but we need to see the backdrop of it so that when we begin to walk through it piece by piece, we'll, I'm hoping that we can remember where the, play, where the pieces are so we know where we are in the process of prayer. All right, let's look at the placement of these structures. Across the inside of the tabernacle hang a special curtain made of fine linen with cherubim skillfully embroidered into the cloth using blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. Hang this inner curtain on gold hooks set into four posts made from acacia wood and overlaid with gold. The posts will fit into the silver bases. When the inner curtain is in place, put the Ark of the Covenant behind it. This curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. Then put the Ark's cover, the place of atonement, on top of the Ark of the Covenant, inside the most holy place. Place the table and lampstand across the room from each other outside the inner curtain. The lampstand must be placed on the south side and the table must be set toward the north. Make another curtain from fine linen for the entrance of the sacred tent and embroider exquisite designs into it. Using blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, hang this curtain on gold hooks set into five posts made from acacia wood and overlaid with gold. The post will fit into five bronze bases. Place it on the left side, place it on the right side. Put it on the south side, like I told you. Put this one on the north side, like I told you. Because that's where I want it. Why? Because it's my house. It's not your house. Our bodies have now become the temple of the living God. The outer court. Let's look at the outer court. The brazen altar upon which the sacrificial animal was offered and their shed blood typify Christ's redemptive work on the cross on our behalf whereby all who put their faith in, the, in his shed blood are justified and receive remission of sins. All right, so the lamb placed on the brazen altar is typical of Jesus Christ being placed on the cross. The brazen labor provided for the priest only so he could wash before entering the tabernacle. As they wash in the labor, the mirrors reflected their images, reminding them of how God saw them. The labor speaks of Christ as our sanctification. Let's look at the brazen altar. Using acacia wood, make a square altar, seven and a half feet wide, seven and a half feet long, and four and a half feet high. Make a horn at each of the four corners of the altar so the horns and altar are all one piece. Overlay the altar and its horns with bronze. The ash buckets, shovels, basins, meat hooks, and fire pans will all be made of bronze. Make a bronze grating with a metal ring at each corner. Fit the grating halfway down into the firebox, resting it on the ledge built there. For moving the altar, make poles from acacia wood and overlay them with bronze. To carry it, put the poles into the rings at the two sides of the altar. The altar must be hollow, made from planks. Be careful to build it just as you were shown on the mountain. The brazen labor. 
the Lord said to Moses, Make a large bronze wash basin with a bronze pedestal. Put it between the tabernacle and the altar, and fill it with water. Aaron and his sons will wash their hands and feet there, before they go into the tabernacle to appear before the Lord, and before they approach the altar to burn offerings to the Lord. They must always wash before ministering in these ways, or they will die. This is a permanent law for Aaron and his descendants, to be kept from generation to generation. Who shall ascend into thy holy hill? He that hath clean hands, holy ghost, and a pure heart. I've got to wash to enter before the king. This is not for just the pastors and the ministers. This is all who have come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because we have all become priests before the Lord. We are a part of the priesthood. This is not pastor and associate and ministers and evangelists and missionaries and then the rest of the congregation. No, this is every person who is going to come before Almighty God has to face the brazen altar, face the brazen labor. This is a pattern for prayer. How do I approach Almighty God? This is how we live our lives. I've got to live clean lives, clean hands and a pure heart. Wash my hands, wash my feet, speaks to the very conduct of my life. Every day that God watches our lives, he's expecting to, to see clean lives that are walking upon this planet, representing him because we have now become a part of the priesthood that represents Jesus Christ in the earth. Build me a house. Build me a house so I can dwell amongst my people. That's the outer court. The tabernacle proper, speaking to the structure itself now, not the outer court, not the outer court with the fence, but the building itself provides a 15 feet wide, 45 feet long, and 15 feet high structure. It's divided into two portions, the holy place and the most holy place, or the holy of holies. 48 boards comprise the walls, 20 boards on, on the north and on the south side, six on the west and sides and two corner boards. Each boards are 15 feet long, 27 feet, 27 inches wide, um, covered with gold and set in two golden tenons, which were secured in silver bases. The boards were held together by five golden rods, four on the, outer, on the outside and one on the inside. The whole structure had four coverings. Inner linen of embroidered fine linen, goat's hair over the linen and the ram skin over the dyed red, over the goat hair. So ram skin covering, which is dyed red, that was placed over the goat's hair and the waterproof porpoise skin over the ram skin. So you're actually looking on the screen, you're seeing the covering for the tabernacle. The whole place was entered through a hanging called the door. It's right at the front here, while the Holy of Holies was entered through the veil. So previously you saw in the video that except the veil that separated the holy from the holies. So from the outer court where you offer the sacrifice for the animal, the first place you meet upon is the door. All right, Jesus said, I am the door. So you have the, the way, the truth, and the life. So the, 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 the gate on the fence is the way, the door is the truth, and beyond the veil, or the veil itself, is life. All of this actually typified what Jesus Christ did on earth. If you understand the tabernacle, you begin to understand what Jesus did when he came here in the flesh. Because what he did was fulfill exactly the pattern that was laid out in the Old Testament. There were three pieces of furniture in the holy place that typified or typifies the fellowship with Christ. On the right side, the table of showbread with 12 loaves representing the 12 tribes. They had bread enough to feed everybody. And the furnishing typifies Christ who came down from heaven and all who partake of him have eternal life as he is our sustainer. He is the bread that came down from heaven. On the left side of the tabernacle stood seven branch golden lampstand. This is typical of Christ, the light of the world and all who trust in him are given the light of life. That's what happens when we get the Holy Ghost. We get life. God couldn't promise us life if we're not dead. 
So outside of Christ, we're actually dead, disconnected from God himself. So when we receive the Holy Ghost, we get life and that more eternal life, life that does not have an expiration date on it. The one that we're born with has an appointment. But when Jesus said, I come to give you life and that more abundantly, it's life that does not have an expiration date. That's the life that takes us home to glory. We get it from now in the earth through the power of the Holy Ghost. Let's look at the bread from heaven. Then make a table of acacia wood, three feet long, one and a half feet wide, and two and a quarter feet high. Overlay it with pure gold, and run a molding of gold around it. Put a rim about three inches wide around the top edge, and put a gold molding all around the rim. Make four gold rings, and put the rings at the four corners by the four legs, close to the rim around the top. These rings will support the poles used to carry the table. Make these poles from acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And make gold plates and dishes as well as pitchers and bowls to be used in pouring out drink offerings. You must always keep the special bread of the presence on the table before me. The bread of his presence. Let's look at the golden lampstand. Make a lampstand of pure hammered gold. The entire lampstand and its decorations will be one piece. The base, center stem, lamp cups, buds, and blossoms. It will have six branches, three branches going out from each side of the center stem. Each of the six branches will hold a cup shaped like an almond blossom complete with buds and petals. The center stem of the lampstand will be decorated with four almond blossoms, complete with buds and petals. One blossom will be set beneath each pair of branches where they extend from the center stem. The decorations and branches must all be one piece with the stem, and they must be hammered from pure gold. Then make the seven lamps for the lampstand, and set them so they reflect their light forward. The lamp snuffers and trays must also be made of pure gold. You will need 75 pounds of pure gold for the lampstand and its accessories. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. He consistently says, make sure you make it the way. If you stop and think about it, build it according. And if you build it exactly, I'll come within. Somebody needs the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Somebody desire God to tabernacle with them, in them. Mighty God of heaven, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Set the house in order. I'll come and live in there guaranteed my god and savior jesus our bodies that become the living temple our very homes likewise set the house in order i'll come and live inside there when i come and live in there my god of heaven let me tell you something as long as god tabernacle with israel in the wilderness no enemy could come there come 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 nigh them his very presence kept the enemy off there they could not be defeated because the awesome power and the presence of Almighty God tabernacled with the people of God. And rightly so, they were slaves, didn't know how to fight. But be obedient and set it in place and I'll tabernacle with you. I'll live with you. I'll fight for you. Mighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll fight for you. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The golden altar of incense stood about before the veil of the holy place. This altar typifies Christ as our high priest who intercedes for us. And the believer who offers the sacrifice of praise. The burning coals from the brazen altar were placed on the altar of incense. Now the burning coal came from the outer court on the brazen altar. 
taking on the inside where you have the golden altar. You need fire, coal fire, to intercede. Because this altar represents intercession. I can't intercede unless I've gone to the brazen altar and lay my sacrifice for sins and God set it on fire and I take the coals of fire from that altar, bring it inside, light the lamp so I can see, get illumination and see the bread on the table. I get revelation from the word of God and to go into prayer for me to be, to be, to be transported into the Holy of Holies. It takes intercession. But I can't just do intercession until I have fire from the Holy Ghost. Burning coals from the brazen altar placed on the altar of incense over the sweet, over which sweet incense was poured daily. The smoke from the incense represents the prayers of God's people. The heavy veil separated the holy, a holy God from sinful people. Christ represents the veil, and that is death. On the cross, the veil was rent from top to bottom. This opened the way to God through his shed blood so that we could come boldly to the throne of grace. Inside the Holy of Holies, you have the Ark of the Covenant. On top of the Ark, the rectangular box over with the gold, was the two cherubims facing each other, looking down towards the mercy seat with their wings stretched over it. It was on the mercy seat that the high priest sprinkled the blood on the day of atonement, which God enabled to cover the sins of the priest and the people. Without, without, with the, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. The nation would still be guilty before God, but somebody had to, st had to stand in the gap and make atonement for them. And all this structure facilitated that. So a holy God could actually have fellowship with sinful humanity. My God and Savior Jesus. Let's go to the altar. Then make a small altar out of acacia wood for burning incense. It must be 18 inches square and 3 feet high, with horns at the corners carved from the same piece of wood as the altar. Overlay the top, sides, and horns of the altar with pure gold and run a gold molding around the entire altar. Beneath the molding, on opposite sides of the altar, attach two gold rings to support the carrying poles. The poles are to be made of acacia wood and overlaid with gold. Place the incense altar just outside the inner curtain, opposite the ark's cover, the place of atonement that rest on the Ark of the Covenant. I will meet with you there. Every morning when Aaron trims the lamps, he must burn fragrant incense on the altar. And each evening when he tends to the lamps, he must again burn incense in the Lord's presence. This must be done from generation to generation. Do not offer any unholy incense on this altar or any burnt offerings, grain offerings, or drink offerings. Once a year, Aaron must purify the altar by placing on its horns the blood from the offering made for the atonement of sin. This will be a regular annual event from generation to generation, for this is the Lord's supremely holy altar. Ark of the Covenant. Make an ark of acacia wood, a sacred chest, three and three quarter feet long, two and a quarter feet wide, and two and a quarter feet high. Overlay it inside and outside with pure gold, and put a molding of gold all around it. Cast four rings of gold for it, and attach them to its four feet, two rings on each side. Make poles from acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Fit the poles into the rings at the sides of the ark to carry it. These carrying poles must never be taken from the rings. They are to be left there permanently. When the ark is finished, 
Place inside it the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant which I will give to you. Then make the ark's cover, the place of atonement, out of pure gold. It must be three and three quarter feet long and two and a quarter feet wide. Then use hammered gold to make two cherubim and place them at the two ends of the atonement cover. Attach the cherubim to each end of the atonement cover, making it all one piece. The cherubim will face each other, looking down on the atonement cover with their wings spread out above it. Place inside the ark the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, which I will give to you. Then put the atonement cover on top of the ark. I will meet with you there and talk to you from above the atonement cover between the gold cherubim that hover over the Ark of the Covenant. From there, I will give you my commands for the people of Israel. I will meet with you there and I will talk with you. That's where we go in prayer. That's where we hear the voice of God. And they've gone from the outer court to the holy place, to the most holy place. I get there and God talks and I receive instructions as to what to do, when to do, how to do. God has put in place a prescription as to how to approach him. He can't be approached anyhow. He's got to be approached the way he told us, tells us how to approach him. We can't run in on the king. Um, if Esther tried to do, well, Esther, Esther got through, but she was already in the palace. So persons who try to approach the king without him stretching out that scepter would actually die. A similar is true. You have to, we have got to approach God the way God prescribes. And there's a prescription. And this structure is the prescription as to how to approach Almighty God, how to communicate with him in prayer. The priest appearance from the tabernacle would represent, would represent to the people God's acceptance of the blood atonement and the covering of their sins for another year. Christ. As the believer high priest offered his own blood to put away sins, he is the believer's propitiation, satisfying the righteous demand of a holy God for the judgment of sin and opening the way from him to freely give, for him to freely forgive people from their sins. This pattern finds its fulfillment in Jesus the Messiah, who, who has justified us by his blood, cleansed and fed us through his word, light the path before us and has made intercession for us. Because of him, we have access through the veil to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy on the merit of his blood. Holy God, Jesus, 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 Jesus. The tabernacle prefigure of the church. Let's wrap this up. So here's a prefigure. So we look at the purpose, we look at the pattern, now we're looking at the prefigure of the church, which is who we are. Today, God dwells in a spiritual body called the church. Each believer coming together forms what you call a temple. Ephesians 2 tells us that. The tabernacle is holy and was set apart for God's service as the church is. Today we have this awesome privilege, which was only reserved for the high priest once per year. This privilege should cause us to walk circumspectly before Almighty God. The tabernacle also prefigured an individual. So it represents the body of believers and it also represents an individual believer who is also the church. As a sanctuary, we are not at liberty to allow our bodies to be used outside of his designed purpose the temple of god is a holy place it's called a sanctuary because it's set apart it's called a tabernacle because it's the dwelling place it's called the tent of testimony because it testifies of the lord there are various different names that are given to the tabernacle itself which speaks to the role that we play as tabernacles, as sanctuary, as the habitation of Almighty God in the earth, the laws of God, the presence of God, the power of God, 
is reflected through our lives because we have been able to entertain the presence of God in our lives. My God, if you're sick, you can get healing right now because the power and the presence of God is in the house. My God and Savior, mighty God, hallelujah. The tabernacle with its many symbols and types was a shadow pointing to our Savior who is the fulfillment of time tabernacled in this world and opened the way for mankind's redemption. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hallelujah. Through the cross, mighty God and Savior, he opened up the way and made it possible for us to be saved. It's a plan. It's a redemptive plan that brought us salvation. And we understand it from Old Testament perspective. We are able to appreciate what Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary. But it's also a way to approach God and to make connection to God and receive from the Lord as we pray according to the pattern that he shows to us as to how we should come before almighty God. This is who we have become today, the dwelling place of almighty God. May the Lord bless us. We're going to stop for tonight. Next week we'll pick up but when we pick up, we're going to be pick up with, picking up with praying the tabernacle as we proceed forward. So I have this as a background, in a, in a backdrop in our minds so we can see the structure as we make the attempt to walk through the structure and pray accordingly. Fill my house, Lord, with the glory. Build it. And when you finish building it, I, God, will come and live in there, Moses. And when he build it according to the exact pattern God showed to him, then and only then God came and tabernacle. The same thing with Solomon. When he built the temple, it had to be built according to the requirements, according to the specifications. And when it was, God tabernacled within. It's the Holy Ghost coming within. It's the power of God living within. And when he gets in, we have a responsibility to keep him within and to walk circumspectly before him to, to, to shine the light of his love throughout this world so that others can be saved. God bless you tonight. God bless you tonight. This is just an overview, um, just to give us a glimpse of an Old Testament picture of the redemption plan that God has wrought for our own redemption. God bless you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen and amen. All right, I think I see a couple of questions in the chat. Um, before we do that, let us pray. I want to pray. I want to pray right now. I um, want to pray right now. Minister Farkerson is in the room. Brother Damien, please come in and pray for us. No. Brother Damien. Praise the, praise the Lord. You hear me, sir? Yes, go ahead. Let's cancel that feet. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Thank you, thank you Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Shama, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. You are worthy, Hallelujah. Almighty God. Hallelujah. Tabana. Lord, there is no other God like you, Jesus. Holy Lord, God. we thank you tonight, Almighty God, for your word. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you, Holy Ghost, Almighty God, for your plans, Almighty God, Allah. that you have laid out for us, Amen. Jesus. And Lord, like we just learned, Almighty God, we pray even now that you will wash us, Holy Ghost, hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, that you will cleanse and sanctify us. Lord, that you will purge us, Almighty God, from every sin almighty jesus hallelujah. hallelujah lord everything not pleasing to you hallelujah but everything that displeases you, almighty jesus hallelujah hallelujah god we pray almighty god hallelujah god because we don't want to die in your presence jesus so we pray present us 
faultless almighty Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah God, for our very, from our very subconsciousness. God, mm -hmm. hallelujah, wash us from our very spirits. Lord, mm -hmm. cleanse us, almighty God. Create in us a yes. clean heart, almighty God. For you said, mm -hmm. who shall enter God into your holy hills? Yes. Who shall enter God into your tabernacle? Lord, yes. who shall enter God into your presence, Holy Ghost? Lord, who shall enter Almighty God? Hallelujah. Those with clean hands Amen. and a pure heart, Jesus. A pure heart. Hand Hallelujah, God. Make our hands clean, Almighty God. For righteousness, Lord, are like filter rags, Jesus. Hallelujah, God. So wash us, God. Hallelujah. And make us whole, Almighty God. Mm. Against you, only God, have we sinned. So, mm. Lord, purge us, Almighty God. Yes. Hallelujah, God. Though our sin may be a scarlet, yes. Lord, make us whiter, Lord. Hallelujah. No, Almighty God, to approach, Lord, your throne room, Almighty Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, we thank you, Almighty God, for your word tonight. Lord, for your teaching tonight, Holy Ghost. Lord, we thank you, Almighty God, hallelujah, that you have laid out a plan for us, God, an example, God, hallelujah, to follow mm. Jesus. Lord, you didn't leave us, Almighty God, without instructions. Yes, Lord, Lord, you didn't leave us, Almighty God, wandering, Lord, but you mm. gave us specific instructions. So, Lord, yes. as we have learned tonight, Jesus, Hallelujah, God, we pray, we pray, we pray, Lord, that it won't just be another night of Bible study, Jesus. But Lord, we pray, Almighty God, that you, that Almighty God will apply, God, these words to our hearts, Almighty God. So if we approach your throne room, Almighty Jesus, Lord, we pray, Almighty God, that you will fill our hearts, Jesus. Lord, as persons without the Holy Ghost, God, heard your word tonight, Lord. We pray, Jesus, that faith, Lord, will arise in their hearts. Lord, we pray, Almighty God, that they will approach you, Almighty God, as you have outlined in your word, Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, we pray, Almighty God, that you, Lord, will fill our temples, Jesus. Hallelujah, God, like you came down, Almighty God, when the priests entered Jesus. Lord, we pray, God, that as we enter into your presence, Holy Ghost, hallelujah, God, that you will minister to us, Jesus. Lord, as we enter into your presence, Almighty Jesus, oh, hallelujah, oh. God, hallelujah, like how nothing died in your presence, God, hallelujah, like how the bread, Almighty God, was fresh just the same yes. in your presence, Holy Ghost, like how Aaron Rod, Almighty God, did not wither or die, God, hallelujah, in your presence, God, like how the incense, Lord, continue to burn in your presence, Jesus, burning us holy ghost hallelujah jesus let our worship lord will come lord like a sweet smelling incense almighty god into your nostril jesus so lord we pray almighty god that you will keep us almighty god let this very word and teaching tonight, Holy Ghost, change our hearts, Almighty oh, God. Hallelujah. That tonight, Almighty Jesus, Lord, hallelujah, there will be a shift, Almighty God. Yes. We command a shift, Almighty Jesus, in the atmosphere, Almighty God. Hallelujah. Lord, help us to take literal word from your Bible, Jesus. And apply to our lives, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, God. That will be gold in your presence, Almighty Jesus. Hallelujah, God. So have your way tonight, Jesus. Even if the questions are being asked tonight, Jesus. Lord, we pray for revelation, Almighty Jesus. Hallelujah. As they are being answered, Almighty God. We pray for clarity, God. Let there be an encounter tonight, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let there be an experience tonight, Almighty God, like never before, Jesus. As we learn, God, how to pray, Almighty God. Last, um, Almighty God, Sunday, Jesus. Hallelujah. And we learn how to enter, God, into the holies of holies tonight. Jesus. Lord, we pray, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. For a mighty ship, Almighty God. 
in our prayer lives, God. A mighty shift, Almighty God, the way we pray. A mighty shift, Almighty God, the way we come to you, Almighty Jesus. So, Lord, remove, Almighty God, every scale, Almighty Jesus. God, every blockage, Almighty Jesus. Everything, Almighty God, that caused misunderstanding and not to be clear, Almighty God, we pray that you remove it, Lord, so your word, Almighty God, will be a light to our spirits, Almighty Jesus. Lord, have your way tonight, Jesus. Hallelujah. Even now, Lord, we pray that someone will pray, Lord, will arise, almighty Jesus, and be filled to overflow tonight. That someone will even be delivered, God, tonight and heal. Lord, have your way, almighty God, as we press in your presence, as we enter your tabernacle, as we enter, Lord, hallelujah. The holies of holies, Lord, we pray, God, that you will come, Lord, like a consuming fire. Hallelujah, God, and consume our sacrifice. Hallelujah, God, consume our praise and our worship, Almighty God. Consume sickness, God. Consume, Almighty God, unbelief and doubt and fear. Hallelujah, God, consume every chain, Lord, that hold your people bound, Almighty God. Lord, have your divine way. Lord, we thank you, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, God, we thank you, Lord. That your divine will be done tonight, Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you. Lord, we give you thanks. Lord. Somebody give him thanks even now. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Holy Ghost. Make me your dwelling place, oh God. Tabernacle, tabernacle in here with us for your glory. God bless you. Um, I did notice a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one, let me see if I can remember, or somebody can help me, one of the technical team members. Certainly, sir. The question was, does overlaid in the word mean the same as plated, as in, well, plated, as in gold plated, where the gold covers another material? If so, what is underneath? And references me to the table. All right, very good. So um, how we know gold plated today, gold plated is something that doesn't last very long. It's temporary and it just glitters for a moment and then goes. This is, this is, this is not plated as anything there, but it's, it's, it's solid gold, real gold. Um, it is overlaying acacia wood. So the structures, various numbers of uh, various different structures that are in the tabernacle are overlaid with the gold. But I'm careful to say it is not plated because of what we know plated to be today. That's not what it is. So this is gold overlaying these, these wood. This is acacia wood. These are hard, quote unquote, indestructible wood. These would grow up as trees in the desert and because of the dry, harsh condition, not even um, chichi can actually eat the wood. It is so hard. And so those are the wood, that, those are the, the, the trees that they use and build the structure, like the table for the showbread, the table for the golden altar, the altar, brazen altar on the out, outside, and the Ark of the Covenant. There are two furnishings that doesn't have any wood in it. It is the Brazen labor where they wash themselves and the golden lampstand, the menorah does not have any wood at all. All the other furnishing, including the building itself, is overlaid with gold. The outer court also, acacia wood, outside is overlaid with bronze, while inside is overlaid with gold. Gold represents divinity, the wood represents humanity. So you're looking at Jesus Christ as the God-man. He's both God and man. And similarly, when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, 
the wood represents our human nature, while the Holy Spirit represents the gold. So we are both wood and gold. Hence, what you see in the tabernacle in terms of the very makeup of the structure itself. Um, there's something about Brother Damien while he was praying said that I want to just address. You cannot die in the presence of the Lord. Notice that Nate, um, Aaron had two boys, Nadab and Abihu. God killed them before they got into the presence. They made an attempt to bring strange fire into the tabernacle. Strange fire is fire that did not come from the brazen altar outside where you lay a sacrifice for, the, for, the, for your sins, and God would normally send the fire from the Holy of Holies. Let, let, let me paint the picture for you. You take the sacrifice, put it on the altar outside. God sent a fire from the Holy of Holies inside, where the Ark of the Covenant is, straight outside, and light, the, light the, the sacrifice. Light that lamp, light that ox, whatever it is that you lay, and set it on fire. Once the, the sacrifice is approved of God and acceptable, the fire comes out and consumes that sacrifice. So these boys took fire that did not come from that altar. God killed it. God didn't kill them inside the courtyard. God, God killed them outside. They made an attempt to come inside with fire and God killed them outside because you cannot die in the presence of the Lord. It's impossible. So God will, if God see you coming in and you don't, you know you're going, not going to follow the, 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 the instru instructions that he has given concerning how to minister before the Lord, he's going to take you out before. So he's not going to kill you inside his presence because there, there's no death in the presence of Jesus Christ. And like Brother Damien, while he was praying, he also made mention of the fact that you had an almond stick, which was Aaron's rod that was not planted in the ground, that was alive. It pushed out a branch, pushed out a, a, a fruit, beer, flower, and fruit. The golden part of manna stayed fresh as long as it was in the presence. So you can't die if you're in the presence. So if there's any death, it's going to take place outside. And that's what you see in history where anybody who died, when it comes down to tabernacle, they died on the outside and not in the inside. Another question? All right, so Sister Destiny is saying, can I pray with my eyes? Can we pray with our eyes open? Because I find it hard to pray with my eyes open. Well, she corrected to say closed for the latter. I think she said okay. she can't hard to pray with her eyes closed. Okay. You can pray with your eyes open or closed. It doesn't matter. Um, um, usually we close it to close out the distraction because it can be very distracting when we're um, looking around. And when you close the eyes, there's some amount of focus that actually takes place. Um, but it's, you can pray with the eyes open and closed. Sir, yes. Um, just, just to clarify, is that the priest went in that something would be tied around his waist, and um, that if he if any uncleanness was found, or if he really wasn't right, then and he dropped dead in the presence there, then he, he would be drawn out. Um, clarify that with me point that nobody dies right so that's a jewish myth that's not scriptural um it's a jewish myth that the jews came up with a couple of years ago uh, well a couple hundreds of years ago and put it out there but that is not scriptural any at all you'll never find where any priest ever died and any priest ever put any rope around themselves to be pulled out of the presence of the lord um there are a couple of the miracles that the lord did for the priesthood especially for aaron when he gets into the presence of the Lord. And one of the miracles is that he cannot die in the presence of the Lord. So there's no scriptural reference for any rope being tied around the priest. It's a Jewish myth. And, and, and not only that, when you get into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, there's no, that beautiful garment that you see the priest wear is not what he wears into the Holy of Holies. He wears a white tunic when he gets before God. The glory that you see, is for the outside where people will see. But when he gets before God, he removes his glory because that can't, he can't come in the presence of the glory of the Lord and glory by himself. So he gets rid of that garment. So, so, so the bell that you hear that they talk about in the Holy of Holies does not take place any at all in the Holy of Holies. That only happens in the, in the holy place and there's no rope necessary at all for the priest. Sir, yes. sir. Um, know it and that each time the lord give them an instruction 
he also said this shall be followed by generation is there anywhere in the world know that these instructions are still followed? A very good question, brother, brother Livingston. I love that question. Beautiful. Thank you very much for that question. All right. So the this pattern was given yeah, to us, right? I'm hearing clearly. Okay. He's asking, he, he made note of the fact that um, the scripture kept on saying, and by the way, the, the recording that you heard is, is literally the scriptures. The scripture has been read. It's not, it's not a paraphrase. It's the actual scripture being read. If you read the scripture and look at each other verse, what you heard was actually the verses. So the scripture verse says, make it according to the pattern. And then Brother Livingston is saying, it contains to say from generation to generation to generation. It must be from one generation to the next. So he's asking, is it being practiced today? All right, so let me answer the question. Now, um, in the time of Christ, after, after Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection, um, Israel came under attack, and in AD 70, the very temple that they used to offer these sacrifice was um, plundered. The Bible says not one stone is going to be left upon another. So they have not been able to do that physical demonstration of taking these lambs and these goats and doing this thing. But the objective was not that they would be doing that because the blood of animals can't really atone for the sins of mankind. So all that was happening in the Old Testament was a prefigure a shadow of things to come. So today, we're doing it, but we're doing it in a spiritual sense. So we don't need a lamb anymore because Jesus has become the lamb. So in this generation, it is being done, but it's being done from a spiritual perspective. However, in the future, right now as we speak, Israel is preparing itself to go back. But in order for them to do that, they need to rebuild a temple, which is what we see happening in, in the Middle East right now. There's an attempt, and, and they have actually gone ahead and rebuilt some of these furnishing already. I got a chance to go to Israel, and when I went there, I saw these furnishing, and they have security guards, heavy armory surrounding these furnishings that they have been able to successfully reproduce according to the Bible pattern and heavily guarded. And all they want now is the temple to, to, to reinstitute this kind of practice and this kind of uh, Judaism, Judaistic practice that they normally were accustomed to doing. So um, Israel naturally can't do it because they don't have a temple to do it. But there is plans to, to restart it down the road. But there is a spiritual significance to it, which is what has come to us today as a church, because all of that was done from the natural does relate to us spiritually. And that's what the Lord is pointing to, us being redeemed. And so today, when we come and we offer sacrifice for the sin, we don't want to take the lambs or the turtle doves. We make up an appeal to the perfect lamb, which is Jesus Christ, who became the ultimate lamb for our sins. So we don't have to be always getting another lamb or getting another turtle dove to come care for our sins. We just come to Jesus. And Jesus' blood covers our sins and cleanses us. So that's how it gets from one generation to the next. So, so we would, hold on, Brother Livingston, we wouldn't do it like how it's done in the Old Testament because it was a fulfillment. Jesus actually fulfilled that. So we do what now Jesus did from a spiritual perspective. Make sure, I want to just make sure that Brother Livingston get this. So we would do this spiritually and not naturally. All right? So somebody was coming with a question. Yes, Pastor Willits. Um, so the question that I have, it is, I'm not sure if it's fully relatable, but I noticed that the closing picture that you had, um, it had the fire covering the sky. And, you know, the scripture says that, you know, he's a fire by the night and cloud by the day. And being in the wilderness, it's a journey. So seeing that all of these things were built from scratch, is it that while they're going about in their journey that this thing can be moved with them? Yes, exactly so. It's a tent and what would happen? So you'd literally see, let, let me just bring about that image. You'll actually literally see a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of 
cloud by day sitting over the tabernacle structure. You ever seen the photograph now? Yes, I can see it. All right, good. So you literally look and you see a literal fire by night from over the most holy place that stretched from the tabernacle straight to the sky. And in the day, it becomes a pillar of cloud. So they knew that God was with them. But when it's time for them to move, what happens? The fire goes and give them an opportunity to now take down the tabernacle structure. And the Levites were immediately around the tabernacle has the responsibility. So that's Gershonites, Mirahites, Kohathites, Moses, Aaron, and his sons now get in position and they're designated who to carry the ark, who to carry the fence, who to carry the table of shoebread. There are certain burdens that are assigned to certain people. You can't carry certain weight because it's assigned to a particular person or a particular group of persons. So one set of the Levites carry the fence. One set carry the outer court furnishing. Another set carry the holy place furnishing. Another set carry the most holy, holy. And they had to be covered. They couldn't be exposed to the outer element. They had to be kept covered. So once the fire goes, they know it's time to move. And they move and God tell them where to go and they stop and God tell them to erect the temple again and they put up the tent. And when they put it up, God comes and come back right in the tabernacle and the fire is there again. Okay, that, I understand. That cloud covered them during the day because it's, it's, it's pelting hot in, in the desert and, and the fire keep them warm at night because it's, 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 it's horribly cold at nights in the desert. So where does the cloud come from? If if the tabernacle is it is um pull apart and it's moving to the new location, where, where and in this picture it's coming from the tabernacle because it's already set up. But where would the would the would the cloud just be in the sky like all clouds are in the sky now, or would it be coming from one of the instruments created right there? All right. So the the. You remember when um, Elijah, when he was on Mount Carmel, and said, Lord, answer by fire, send the fire, and the fire came down from heaven to the sacrifice, it's the same thing. So the fire came down on top of the Holy of Holies. And that fire, you'll see the fire in the night, but it, 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 is, it, is a, it is a cloud in the day, and it's a, it's a fire at night. So you actually see a pillar. Just um, for those of us who have been in the country parts, and when it gets very you'll see that from a distance, you can see when the cloud is sitting on the mountain. When you're in it, you'll see mist. So right over the structure, there's this mist that, that is, is a cylindrical structure that runs from the holy place straight up into heaven. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, sis. All right, so I see a question from Sister Camille about strange fire. What does it look like today? So when you bring revelation that is not from the cross of Calvary, not from the brazen altar, that is strange fire. So any truth, any word that is going to be taught has to come from a place of consecration, a place where offerings for sin has been accepted and God sent the fire. So when I offer myself as a sacrifice and I offer myself in service before the Lord and God answers, cleanse me of my sins, then he begins to reveal to me his word and that is revelation that comes. If I'm going to bring something outside of what the cross teaches, that is strange fire. Outside of me coming before God and making a sacrifice for my sins so I can get into the presence of the Lord and say something other than what he has given to me, that is strange fire. That's what it looks like. It's lies and concocted ideas and ideologies made up by men that, that, that is being promoted as the truth of God's word. Private interpretation. All right, that's it. All right, that looks like it. I'm looking to see if I see any more. I don't. All right. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Sir, sir, can I ask a quick one? I was going to type, but time. When, um, 
Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Ghost. And um, was that in the temple? So explain the difference between that in the temple and in the presence of God. Because the word said that they lied to the Holy Ghost. Right. Not to man. Can you expound on that? demonstration please sir and differentiate that from being in the presence of the all right so um at that particular point in time the church had just started and was now spreading and um usually what we see in scripture whenever there's a precedence being set god's judgment usually turns up at that point in time um similar to what happened to the boys in the wilderness when God killed them. So they were trained before and now they took for granted what God instructed. And so when that happened, it set a precedent for you to know that God is serious about what he's saying. In a similar instance, when you come to the New Testament, here comes God setting up his, his church and moving forward. And, and there's, a, there's a unity that is established where persons are now giving and selling their things and pouring in. And here comes persons who are being deceptive in the process. And God said, we're not going to have any of it because this is actually going to disrupt the unity. This is going to make an avenue for the adversary because somebody's going to falsely pretend that they're doing something when they're really not true. And we're going to, set the, we're going to ensure that the precedence or, or this initiation is maintained. So when these, when Ananias and Sapphira came and lied, they lied to Almighty God. Um, Peter got, got a word of knowledge that they actually lied and pronounced under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, the judgment on them because you are about to interrupt the move of God. That's how the people are now uni united and they're unified and they're moving together. And this was about to interrupt the flow and the move of God. And so God shut it down. Oh, sir, can that happen today? Of course it can. Translating, right. So that's where I'm going. So in terms of us now in the spirit and if, if for the most part, God is there in an operation and a strange fire comes into that presence, the awesome presence of God will also demonstrate his seriousness by taking them out through death. So that's what I wanted to differentiate from like the life, the source of God being like the source of life to sustain us in his presence. Right. and his seriousness and dealing with what he does not accept in his presence and taking it out, which we can um, attribute to calling it death, removing it. So, so it, can you, happen, it can happen today if, if, we are, we are, if we get to that place where that unity and that oneness takes place amongst the body of Christ. Anything that actually tries to oppose that God, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an automatic repulsion of something that's about to infect the body right. and so god responds to it and we see that happening from one from one generation to the next there's a number of intervals when god is setting a pace and about to make a move and something um again let's go back to old testament um they were taking they were taking joshua was taking canaan and um we took jericho and so you, the pace is now being set. And what's what happened now? Somebody went and stole the Babylonian garment and put it in their camp. You're interrupting what God is about to do because God has given you the, the length and breadth of the land. You must go in Joshua and conquer. And somebody got in the mix and stole from God. Again, just like these people were lying and saying that we sell this to this. Here comes the Old Testament saints who stole the Babylonian garment and hid it in their, their own camp. This is the move of God. This is the, this, so, so you take the, the take Jericho and you're about to take um, the next city and you will steal from God. You can't do that. And so God said, we're going to deal with it. So kill it. Don't de just, don't, just, just, just wipe it out clean. Don't pardon it. Same thing happened under Moses, Moses' dispensation. When the rebellion came against the man of God, they're moving again. They're moving and they're, they, they, the people are united and ready to go. And these persons come and say, yes, we're going to use our authority. Moses, you're not the only person that hear from God. Step out of the way. Um, we can do our own thing. And they start to do their own tabernacle furnishing. And God said, we'll not have any of this here. Bam! Open up the earth and swallow them. Judgment took place. We see it happens from time to time when there's an initiation of a move of God at the beginning of a, of, a, of a move. We normally see things like this happening. 
in the scripture. Thank you very much, sir. God bless. Yes, sir. And, and in both instances, they both thought that they were dealing with man rather than God. That's another thing. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at the man, Moses, they're looking at the man, Peter, and not understand that it's God mm -hmm. you're dealing with. It's not man. It's God you're dealing with. All right, we're going to go into prayer for these that are before us tonight for salvation, healing, covering. All right, so let me ask, Minister Baker, are you with us? All right, Minister Baker sounds like he's gone. Or the absence of the sound indicates that he's gone. All right, let's go to All right, I think Ella Brown is still with us. Yes, sir, I'm here. Yes, sir. Um, could you pray for um, salvation and healing, sir? Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise. Oh God, you are everything. Oh God, you are the light that shine our path. Tonight, Lord, thank you. Oh God, for revelation. Thank you, Lord, for taking from higher heights and the death. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for your precious blood shed. Oh God, your songwriter said it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. Oh God, your blood that gives us strength from day to day will never lose its power. We thank you, Lord, for the salvation of man you came. And oh God, we might have life and have it more abundantly. And so we thank you tonight, Lord, for now, Francis and Charlotte Martin, oh God Almighty, that their faith in Christ will be increased. That they too, oh God, they're in the hearing of your word. Oh God, your word says that faith comes by hearing. And oh God, a word tonight, oh God, will be imparted into their hearts. Lord Jesus, and that faith will come alive. Lord Jesus, that their belief, oh God Almighty, will be strengthened in you. That they too, Lord, will come to know you. And to know life everlasting for right. Oh God Almighty, Jesus Christ, He too, Lord God, will be born again, will experience the born again. Oh God, experience in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray for your family, Denise, Denise, Rosanne, Dravain, Jane, uh, for salvation and deliverance. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, thank you, Lord Jesus. You came that we can have life and have it more abundantly. May, O oh God Almighty, your great salvation, Lord, come to their hearts even now, Jesus. Precious blood shed. May, O oh God Almighty, they experience, O oh God, the cleansing power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then, O oh God, we see in the hospital, Balm in Gilead. O oh God Almighty, let that comforting oil, that healing oil, O oh God, soothe the oil. The wound today, Lord Jesus. Oh God, grant our strength in those joints. Oh God Almighty, restore, oh God, our health. Oh God, um, we continue to see improvement, Lord Jesus Christ, in her health. Still, oh God, our balm in Gilead. John, oh God, for complete healing as she recuperates in the name of Jesus Christ. It's an elephant. Mild case of shingles. Shingles is not a big for you, Lord. Oh God Almighty, by your stripes we're healed. And so we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for touching those eyes. Oh God Almighty, that Lord God is his 2020 vision will be restored, and that Lord God shingles will disappear in the name of Jesus Christ. The midst of Spencer. Oh God, cancer is not a big for you either. Oh Lord Jesus Christ. So we lift our faith on their behalf tonight. And oh God, you will come through for her, touch her body, and restore health. Who in the hospital? Jesus. The shorter back pain, this is feel. Camille rather, not feeling well. Jesus, your children. 
Oh God Almighty, let healing media bread tonight. Oh God Almighty, let your healing virtue flow. Oh God Almighty, as you show yourself strong on behalf of your children. Thank the Lord God. You are still our healer. You are still our deliverer. You are still our way maker. Hallelujah to God. You've done it before, Lord. You can do it again. And so we raise our faith on behalf of your children. Oh God, that you come through for them in a mighty way. Thank you for hearing us tonight and for blessing our hearts. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. And as we continue to pray, Lord, for covering and deliverance, we pray for Sister Amory Cole and family for their strength mm -hmm. as they get ready to bear the remains of their lost loved one. We pray also for Sister Shani for strength to deal with the stressful work environment and also for Dwight. Lord, we hold these names before you and so many others. Whatever unspoken requests that might not have come in, Lord, we pray also for them in the name of Jesus. We pray for your divine covering. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Deliverance, oh God, from these maladies, from these challenges, in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we push into your presence, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us to know how to enter therein. Oh, God, to experience your power, your grace, your mercies, and your love, your healing virtue. My God, do your good pleasure in our lives. We commit these into your care. Everybody online tonight, God, we thank you. Oh, God, we pray that we'll take these words and apply them to our hearts and to our lives and live accordingly so that your name will be glorified. We commit, oh, God, each of these requests and every person in this room tonight to the glory and the honor of your name. Have your way, Lord. Cover us under your blood and grant us a powerful week. Even as we go into fasting on tomorrow, God, we pray and continue to pray, oh God, for our brothers and our sisters who are yet to become, oh God, recipients of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, give us a hunger, Lord, and a thirst to stand in the gap like that woman who stood in the gap on behalf of her daughter, knowing, God, that you can do immeasurably more than we can ask, think, or even imagine. God, my Savior, Jesus, oh God, strap a burden on our hearts to stand in the gap on behalf of our brothers and our sisters as you work out your purpose. Oh God, when Zion travails, she shall bring forth. Oh God, cause us to be pregnant for your God. Hallelujah. And to give birth to the kingdom of, birth to the children of God into the kingdom of God. Oh God, have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Have your way, God. Hallelujah. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. In your precious name, Jesus Christ, we give you thanks even now. Amen and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. So on Thursday night, we come back to our prayer meeting at 7.30. And on Friday night, our youth service. And should in case you need counseling or prayer, then the numbers are on your screen. Please feel free to call and somebody will share with you as the Spirit of the Lord continues to lead. Also, please make note of the Sunday school classes that we have online. I'm asking you to please invite out a friend, send the link, WhatsApp the link to somebody and say, I'm inviting you to come with me to the Sunday school. Call them on the morning as well to remind them to log on in there. They can roll over out of their bed. They don't even have to put on their clothes. Just, just log in and just tune into the word of the Lord and just, you know, just learn, come and learn and, 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 and feed from feed from the table, the table of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. And just may know that our, our, our main services are uploaded to our YouTube page. That is Bethel United Church, Apostolic Portmore. Bethel United Church, Apostolic Portmore. Please like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Let's raise our hands for the benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. And let all God's people say, amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. Let's continue to pray one for the other. Reach out and touch someone.